with the message that I had uh, this morning. The theme was questions only we can answer, and I'm, when I say we, I mean us personally. Uh, I asked this morning, are you ready for the judgment? And uh, another question I asked was, do I judge myself or others? So Jamie, I'm going to be starting with frame number seven. And uh, frame number seven is another question that uh, we see asked uh, based on Romans chapter two and verse four. So these, many of these scriptures will be coming from Romans, although other scriptures will be used as well. Um, do I appreciate God's goodness? I, in verse 4 of Romans 2, uh, let's read these words. Uh, Romans 4, excuse me, uh, it should be 2 verse 4. Romans 2 and verse 4. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? I suppose sometimes we get the idea that if we get people convicted as sinners, uh, then they will automatically recognize uh, their need for God. But this verse emphasizes that it's not man's badness that leads him to repentance, but God's goodness that leads him to repentance. So in other words, when we really comprehend that God is good, that God cares, he's concerned about us personally, uh, that is what motivates us then uh, to accept him as our savior. The fact is, even though some people have seared consciences and will live a life of debauchery, most people are aware of their sinful nature and they may not admit it to themselves or to God. And that needs to be done, of course. We do need to recognize that we are uh, sinners, because in Romans we read, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When I was really young at preaching, just barely 20, I, I went to a church at Flat Fork, Kentucky, outside of the city of Moorhead. <clears throat> it was a very nice community. I really liked the people there. Uh, they had an old church building. Uh, that was very uh, nice to be in, especially in the fall as uh, the pot belly stove, uh, the fires were burning in it. And I can remember when I first went there, I was also supposed to teach the adult Sunday school class, which I did do, and then to preach the sermon. And there was a man in the audience who was very well versed uh, in the scriptures. And I would say something, and he would add to it. And uh, it was very uh, amazing to see his knowledge. And after this went on for several weeks, I was in the home of one of the elders for dinner. And uh, that day, uh, he quoted uh, the verse that I just mentioned, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that was just one of the many things that he said. And uh, I told the people there that in, the, in the room there that day when we was eating with them, when I was eating with them, I said, he is very knowledgeable in Scripture. And I said, maybe he ought to be teaching the lesson. And uh, the elder in the home where I was at said, that man is not a Christian. <laughs> so I thought it was really strange. You know, faith comes by hearing, the Bible says, and hearing by the word of God, and here he had all of these scriptures committed to memory, and still it didn't sink into his spiritual mind. So we do have to recognize that we need the Lord, and that we have sinned, we need 
God's forgiveness. And I, like many uh, others, even though I was uh, 19 when I was baptized, uh, before that, I was like many other people. I just thought I was plain good enough and didn't need uh, heaven. Uh, uh, I mean, I wanted to go there, but I thought I'd go on my own uh, because I did what I was talking about here this morning. I just compared myself with other people. And then where my sisters went to church, uh, before, late, long before I did, even though I went as a child to VBS, there were people uh, in the church that I didn't think lived up to their uh, Christian calling. And so I thought to myself, well, if they're going to make it, I am too. So it's the same old story that a lot of us thought about. But there comes a time in our lives when we really set our pride aside and realize we're in need of a Savior. Because actually, it's slapping the Lord Jesus in the face and God too uh, when we don't admit that uh, we are sinners because... He went to the cross to pay that price. And uh, if, uh, if we didn't have to, if, if we weren't, then he didn't have to do that. So we need to appreciate God's goodness. Another scripture that's very uh, familiar to us is in Luke 15 that shows God's goodness. In Luke 15, we read about the prodigal son and uh, how he's, squandered his father's uh, inheritance until he got to the point that he was really down and out. And he decided that uh, his, his father's servants had a lot better life than he did and he was going back home. Let's just read the part here where he's headed back home in Luke 15, starting with verse number 17. When he came to his senses, that's a very good way of expressing what it's like when we realize that we need the Lord. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. Now, this is what I want to emphasize because it ties in with our appreciation for God's goodness. Notice the next verse, or the part of that verse. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. So you see, God took the initiative uh, to reach out to us, as this parable indicates here. Now, we ask another question uh, from Romans, uh, and this we're going to look at at chapter 5, verses 5 through 11, if you want to uh, turn to that. But uh, is my faith uh, proved by my works? Is my faith proved by my works. Now, we read in the scriptures, of course, that, uh, that we're not saved by works. Uh, for by grace are ye saved, is what Paul wrote. Uh, not by works, lest any man uh, should boast. So, works is definitely, though, a part of the salvation experience. It, it proves our faith. And uh, let's notice, if you will, now uh, to uh, number 5 of Romans, chapter 5 of Romans, starting with verse number 5. Let me look here and see if I should have put Romans 2 for that. I believe I just should have done that and made a mistake on that. So uh, Romans 2. Uh, let's look at uh, verse number 5 and following. But because of your stubborn and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. Now remember, um, 
we had that other question at the beginning of the lesson this morning. Are you ready for the judgment? So here again, he's talking about the judgment. God will repay each person according to what they have done. So the judgment is not just to render punishment to the wicked, but the judgment is also to reward the righteous for what they have done. So he goes to say in verse 7, to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. So you see the two things here uh, in the judgment, rewarding the good and uh, punishing the wicked. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, for God does not show favoritism. Now, along that line, I'd like for us to go to another very familiar passage of Scripture, which is James chapter 2, starting with verse 20, as he shows us the relationship between faith and works. Some religious folks seem to think you can't have both, but they're connected. Faith and works are connected. People of faith will have works. So let's notice chapter 2 beginning with verse number 20. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. That's what we have to understand. They work together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. You know, sometimes we hear religious folks say, well, you're saved by faith only. Well, uh, the King James says uh, it's not by faith only. So let's look at verse 25. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them on a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So do we have those kind of works that prove our faith? Then there's another thought, another question. Do I practice what I preach? Look at Romans 2, starting with verse number 21. Do I practice uh, what I preach? And that's what the, the section that we uh, read there uh, and, and uh, about Abraham and works. Now, we notice that uh, oh here I'm, I'm, in, I'm looking at James I'm sorry go back to Romans 2 and look at verses 21 to 24 I did have it right uh, 2 21 to 24 you then who teach others do you not teach yourself you who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So we don't want to blaspheme the name of Christ by saying one thing and doing another. Then... We have to ask the question I asked this morning, am I in Christ? Romans 8.1 says, 
Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So, even now, we don't have to worry about the judgment if we're Christians. And if we're Christians that are trying to live up uh, to the standards that God gave us. Because there's no condemnation for us. Look at Romans 6, verses 1 through 5. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning? In other words, after we become a Christian, so that grace may increase? Because remember, we're saved by grace. By no means we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized <coughs> into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we've been united with him in death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. And then last of all, I'd like for you to look at Romans 8. And see how we can, as Christians, be more than conquerors. I love this beautiful section of scripture. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen. It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to the slaughter. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord. Those of us that experience the Christian life uh, really appreciate it. If you want that for yourself and have not yet uh, accepted the Lord as your Savior and uh, been repentant and changing uh, your mind about sin, and if you've done that and, and you want that out of your life, uh, that's called repentance. And then if you're willing to confess that Jesus is the Christ before witnesses, you're ready then to be baptized, and that can be done this very night at this time. Uh, we'll be using 605 uh, for our closing hymn. Uh, if you want to turn to that, we'll stand uh, at this time, page 605, just as I am. Just as I
I will read what Paul said about communion as the Lord uh, delivered it to him. I'll read first of all about how Jesus told him his body uh, was broken and that the, uh, the loaf was to be taken in remembrance of him. And then, uh, then I'll read about the cup uh, and how it represents his blood. I'll have a prayer for each after I uh, read uh, the first section and then the second, uh, the second section uh, about the cup. I'll have a prayer after that. Uh, Paul said, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So I'll have prayer for the loaf. Lord God in heaven, thank you for instituting this supper for us. This great memorial that requires such fragile pieces to remember, and yet for 2,000 years, uh, Christians have been partaking of these emblems to remember you. We know that this bread represents your body, which was tortured on the cross. Help us to visualize the great price that was paid where you suffered in pain and mental agony. At this time, I'll read about the cup. In the same way, after Jesus took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as these partake of the cup, I pray that it will be a spiritual refreshment and blessing for each of them. We know that this is not a commonplace thing, even though we do it weekly. We know that it's the center of our Sunday worship. And we know, dear God, that you are the center of our lives and our church. So I pray that we'll keep focused on the centrality of your uh, power over the church and that we'll never forget it. Bless these who partake of this cup at this time. In Jesus' name, amen.